Greetings from the people of planet Earth. Democracy Cast from Democracy Watch News. Democracy Cast is available wherever you access your podcasts. You can also hear it at TuneIn Radio. Check out the website where you'll find links to our podcasts and blogs. DemocracyWatchNews.org. This is Mark Taylor Canto, Executive Director for Democracy Watch News in Seattle. Throughout the year, myself and other journalists across the country have been covering major protests against racism and police brutality, which has brought up a lot of situations where journalists have been arrested, have been harassed, have had their rights violated. But in response to this, the Committee for Public, the Committee to Protect Journalists, has come out with a series of guidelines to try to help journalists understand what their legal rights are in these situations. So the following advice and recommendations were developed by the Committee to Protect Journalists. Their website is cpj.org. And it's intended to give the reader some understanding of the rights of a journalist when confronted by law enforcement officers while covering a protest or other political event. And given that these incidents often quickly escalate and that some um, end up in the arrest of journalists, it is generally prudent, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, to comply with an officer's command, even if they're not lawful, only out of consideration for your own physical protection and the protection of the journalists. Afterwards, legal redress can be taught. That's just one um, piece of advice from one organization. There are other groups that have been working on these issues as well, including Reporters Without Borders, the Reporters Committee to Protect, uh, excuse me, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and other organizations internationally and around the world, and, and in the United States on this issue. So here are some quick tips and recommendations from TPJ. Carry your press credentials at all times and ensure credentials are visible to law enforcement. When covering demonstrations, protests, and campaign or political events, make sure you know in advance what restrictions are in place regarding the public's right to access and whether there are any curfews or other restrictions in place at the time. So that requires, this is an aside from our chair, okay, this, uh, that would require doing some research before you attend the event to make sure that you know what uh, executive orders uh, have been issued in the case of Seattle where the mayor restricted an area of Seattle, the Capitol Hill occupied protest zone. Uh, there was res- restricted access to that area for uh, multiple days. Um, so it's good to know where uh, police or uh, city officials have designated uh, areas that are restricted. Now there are some you know, legal uh, issues here. And there were some legal challenges to the authority of them later even being able to make that determination. According to our own city council in Seattle, uh, the mayor was not authorized to make a, a, an autonomous decision like that without consulting and getting the approval of the Seattle City Council. But Mayor Jimmy Durkin did do that during the protests in Seattle over this last year. So back to the guides and recommendations, or the tips and recommendations. Do not trespass on private property to gather news. Do not cross police lines at crime scenes. Comply with location restrictions and barriers absent exigent circumstances. Of course, that's where uh, a discussion would have to begin, and that can take place at another time. But um, when is it acceptable in order to... Uh, get access to information or to observe police activity and to share that uh, information um, uh, and information which is in the best interest of the public to know. When is it possibly um, the right time for a protester to maybe actually um, get arrested? Um, 
And just personally, I can say that there have been several circumstances where I've been threatened with arrest. One was at the offices of Congressman Jim McBurman, his fellow, and I've written about this at Daily Coast and other places where there was a there was a delegate for Bernie Sanders uh, during the 2016 presidential election who refused to leave Jim McDermott's office without speaking to him because he is a super delegate and she wanted to try to convince him to cast his vote for Bernie Sanders. Um, the, uh, the police showed up, um, the protester and their attorney and several other people were ordered to leave the building or be arrested, including myself. And um, I was told twice. Uh, and the second time, the police officer just basically asked me, the, the person who was in charge of missing, uh, are you going to leave or are we going to have to arrest you? So, and I refused to leave. They did not arrest me, however, but uh, the reason I refused to leave is because I wanted to be there to document the arrest of Danae Evans, which was the name of the, the delegate, uh, to make sure that I was able to report on what happened to her. Um, so, although they threatened to arrest me, it never did actually happen, and the arrest took place pretty quickly and was observed by other people as well. So, uh, I think that the public interest was served in that. Um, back to the tips and, and recommendations from the committee to protect journalists. You may record video or audio of public events, including of law enforcement activities at such events, as long as you're not interfering with or obstructing law enforcement activity. So here's another issue. It happens a lot in Seattle where the police will try to put you away or order you away from the arrest of another person. Uh, during an anti-Donald Trump protest, uh, when a, a young student, a female student, was being assaulted by police officers, they had grabbed her and were pepper spraying her at point blank and wouldn't let her cover her face or get away from them. Uh, and so I was trying to film this, and I was ordered by a Seattle police officer to get up on the sidewalk, get up on the sidewalk, because this was during a march in the street. Well, I, I was on the sidewalk, so I had already complied with the police officer's wishes. However, they still peppered spray me in the face because they wanted to stop me from filming this arrest, because that arrest and those kinds of arrests do sometimes uh, and probably should more often end up in lawsuits against the police department, and so they're a little bit... Um, hesitant to allow documentation of some of their activity. <laughs> but that's the whole point. Um, sometimes the primary approach is for a reporter is to be there to document what's happening. And oftentimes it is very helpful in um, police reform movements and civil rights movements to document the activity of police and make sure that it gets out to uh, civil rights organizations, uh, attorneys, the city council, advocates for the protesters and the media. So many times I've also filmed things that I immediately made a reel of and sent to major media as a screener to try to make sure that the that the shit out there. And a lot of times it's a very violent arrest or someone is abused and it's very clearly clearly seen on the video, it can make a difference in whether that officer is ever uh, prosecuted or in any way held accountable for that. In general, it is legal to record video or audio in any public place. So if people are out on the street, or they're at a protest, or they're in a public square, uh, that is considered public property and can therefore record without um, being subject to, to legal action. Private areas are a completely different situation. On private property, you can be ordered off the property by the person who owns the property or is in charge of that property. Uh, you can be uh, barred from filming. Um, oftentimes, if you are going to film a private event or something that takes place in a private building, uh, people will ask you to sign a waiver. Uh, or you, you will ask them if you, if you can sign a waiver, which allows you to do that. Um, Maintain neutrality when covering events if possible. For example, if you join the crowd in chanting or you are carrying signs or wearing slogans related to the events you're covering, um, that can sometimes put your position as a journalist in jeopardy. 
uh, the accused of being biased and um, actually being a protester and not a journalist. There's a very, very fine line there that people have been arguing over for years about what constitutes a journalist and the Borders Without Borders, the International Advocacy Group for Journalists. Uh, by the way, ranks the United States 45th in the world in terms of press freedom, partly because of the arrests of journalists and, and other issues having to do with the press here and police. Um, but they uh, they actually um, call people who are citizen journalists, in other words, people who uh, don't get paid necessarily to do journalism or don't call themselves journalists, but people who often post on social networking platforms, they are considered netizens by Reporters Without Borders, and they, according to Reporters Without Borders, they should be allowed the same rights to freedom uh, of the press and freedom of speech that reporters are. Um, comply with dispersal orders or other directives issued by law enforcement if possible. If engaged in an encounter with law enforcement, explain that you are a journalist covering the event and show your credentials. You may continue to record interactions with law enforcement even if they ask you to leave the area or move on. If law enforcement requests your audio or video recordings, camera, recording devices, equipment, or notes, you may refuse and request that the official contact your media outlet or its legal staff. During a stop and frisk arrest, make it clear to law enforcement that any equipment, memory cards, notebooks, anything that contains journalistic materials or notes uh, must be returned to you and you must have an itemized list. There was a situation I was involved with where uh, someone filmed an arrest, it was actually me. Um, Benaroy Hall, which is a symphony hall in Seattle. During, as an artist, I was performing. I did. A, I was going to do a protest, and uh, even though I didn't disrupt anything or cause any property damage or anything illegal, I was still facing arrest. Um, if I spoke out during that performance, so I was arrested. And then someone filmed from the audience. Police then began contacting the, the people who had access to that video and demanding. They turned it over to the police department. They were saying, because it was evidence in a legal case, um, what my friend did actually was called me and said, Mark, uh, the police want this video. I don't want to get it to them. The um, media is calling me out, and they want the video so, so they can put it on the night we use. What do you want me to do? And I said, sell it to the media <laughs> if you want. I mean, give it to them free if you want to, but get some money if you can. There's a, it's a three years of journalist and get it out there because um, once the police have sole access to evidence, you know, that's not a good situation. Um, so there are many other issues surrounding filming and recording audio in public places and the rights of journalists and uh, the rights or, or lack of rights by law enforcement to confiscate material. And it's definitely a larger question that needs to be discussing length is oftentimes with groups like uh, the community to protect journalists or even major news networks, it's often something that their legal team um, takes care of. Um, so they would be the best to consult if you work for a major network. But there are very first very fundamental first amendment rights of journalists. So some of this is very clear and very very uh, un and there's really no argument against it. There's no legal argument. So the way For instance, right now under the First Amendment, journalists do have the right to gather news. Uh, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution protects both the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. Yeah, it's kind of so journalists yeah. have a right to access public places to gather and disseminate yeah. news. Public places yeah. include sidewalks yeah. and public parks, yeah. but not private property. In addition, yeah. for governmental yeah. property, even those that allow for limited access to the public Members of the public, protesters, and reporters may be barred if the location is not itself public. For instance, the private areas of a courthouse or a jail. And also, hours of access for journalists are generally limited to those when the general public would be permitted access, but not always. There's a whole other issue about uh, limiting time and place of free speech activity, which uh, was an issue during the WHO demonstrations uh, in Seattle. And the court precedent there is that the time and place of a demonstration can
heavy limited. But you cannot tell someone that they are not allowed to protest. In other words, you can say, uh, you can have a march on Thursday from noon to 3, um, and you can limit it to a certain time and place, but you can't tell them you can't march or you can't uh, have a protest. In Seattle, the tradition has become, and it's been this for a while now, if people want to take to the streets, they take to the streets. And the official permitting process is not necessarily uh, the tradition now here anymore. However, at the same time, I also have to add that the police are no longer uh, escorting marches with motorcycle and bicycle cops and trying to block traffic to keep them safe. Um, the protesters are now having to do that for themselves. But private property such as a convention center or a stadium may be used by public entities and public property may be used for private political party conventions. But in either case, journalists may be provided access similar to, similar to the general public. For example, a judge ruled that a state democratic organization holding a convention in the city civic center could not discriminate among journalists by admitting some, but not others. Sure the judge said that a private body leasing a government facility had the same constitutional obligations as the government. And that case is the National Broadcasting Company versus the Association of State Democratic Chairs. Uh, and that was in, uh, in Ohio in 1987. This will vary by jurisdiction, however. Uh, if you expect to be covering a convention or political party gathering, the journalist should attempt to get access and credentials in advance. I can give you an example where the Attorney General of the United States, Alberto Gonzalez, was speaking in Seattle at the Discovery Institute, which is a, a very right-wing sort of conservative institute. And, um, so I wanted to go there as a reporter for KBCS and the Pacific Radio Network and cover the event. And I was hoping to get some questions answered by the Attorney General because there was a huge controversy going on at the time. And he was, uh, he was, this, this was just before his resignation. So one of my questions was going to be, Mr. Attorney General, when are you going to resign? Um, but there was a heads up somewhere of uh, the Discovery Institute people who were holding that event. So when I showed up, they tried to block me from the hall, um, gave me misinformation about where it was and at what time it was. At the time, I was told that it already happened, that it was too late. Then another reporter who was there told me, oh, no, that's not true. It's, it hasn't even started yet. I finally was able to um, get a hold of uh, both the, the news director and later the station manager at KBCS, which is a Pacific affiliate. And they called the, uh, the folks there at the Discovery Institute and apparently threatened legal action or lawsuits or something. So they almost immediately let me in. And I got in just in time to see the Attorney General's presentation. This was a private building, Discovery Institute. It was a Consider a quote public event because it was the Attorney General of the United States there, and it was open to the public. But you didn't necessarily have to um, be a member of this series. You could buy a ticket and go to this event, so it's considered public. So I was able to ask my question: uh, When are you going to uh, resign, Mr. Attorney General? Of course, you did not answer, and basically the discovery. Institute yeah, officials just yeah, ended uh, his speech right there and that's where he out of the hall. Bring over the so, right there. Right there. so I wasn't able to get my question answered, but at least I was able to fight my way in to get it asked. And, it, and you know, I think it did, in its own way, perhaps uh, shorten the length of time that the Attorney General decided to stay in office because it, he knew that that question was going to be asked multiple times. Um, the time place and manner of restrictions of the demonstration is what I was speaking about before. So the government is, according to court president, permitted to impose time, place, and manner restrictions on speech. As long as those restrictions, and this is the most important point, as long as those requirements are content neutral, in other words, um, justified without reference to the content of regulated speech. In other words, you can't say uh, you can only talk about this issue or that issue, you can only talk about this political party, that political party, or this candidate, yeah, or that yeah, candidate. Yeah. You, you yeah. can't, Just you right cannot now. designate, yeah. the government cannot tell you what you yeah. can and cannot say. Uh, these these are restriction requirements are ne narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest. 
So you can't have that either. You can't have um, the government telling you you can't protest because you know you're protesting against the government. And that was one of the issues I had with Mayor Jane Durkin this last year was that she is uh, have, you know she gave an, an executive order demanding uh, that the police arrest people in and around the chop zone. And in my article at the Seattle Star and other places, what I was trying to point out was that that was a conflict of interest when a mayor tells the police to arrest people who, who are protesting against the mayor, which is basically what was happening. One of the demands of the protesters was the resignation of the mayor. Um, also, the government um, has to leave open, ample, alternative channels for communication of the information. So you can't say, um, you can't protest until tomorrow at noon, and between noon and three, and any information that you're trying to get out about this event is now censored or illegal. You can't tell people they can't hand out flyers about it if it's coming up. You can't stop the flow of information. You can only uh, restrict the time, place, and manner of a demonstration. You cannot restrict the information surrounding the reasons for that demonstration. That would also be an overstep by the government. So these restrictions could include noise restriction ordinances, as well as a zone system in anticipation of a demonstration, such as demonstration zones, or what we call them in Seattle as no protest zones, mm -hmm. um, which has been a tradition here since 1999 in the World Trade Organization demonstrations. That has never been successfully challenged in court. So there are times when a city officials will either declare an emergency or even without that, they will designate certain parts of the city for demonstrations um, and try to combine demonstrations to those zones. My personal belief is that is not constitutional, but um, they can also try to create what are called uh, journalist-only zones. So you have the, the press pit, or you know, where they put all the press behind the police lines or whatever. Um, and also, uh, they can restrict areas for okay. pedestrian traffic at that point too. So the police can actually uh, uh, block, you know, block off crosswalks if they think that it's going to cause disruption during the protest or something like that. Um, in addition, restrictions may prohibit protesters from bringing camping materials or staying overnight in public spaces. And that's an issue that a lot of people dealt with around the country during the Occupy Wall Street movement, where people were occupying public spaces, often camping there were tents for long periods of time. Uh, in Seattle and other cities, police swept those areas and arrested people who refused to leave. In general, parks uh, have, a, have an open and public parks, at least in this part of the country, have an open and closing time. And so it's considered illegal or trespass to be in the park after 11 o'clock. Um, however, that's not strictly enforced at all in, in my city in Seattle, but it's the general rule. Um, during the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations and recently, people have occupied public parks and not left for long periods of time. And the response has been that they are usually allowed to stay in those areas for a certain period of time. And in this last case, uh, in one of these cases, because there are tents and parks all over Seattle now because of mass homelessness, but Mayor Jimmy Griffin was able to uh, get the police to clear people out of Cal Edison Park uh, in the child zone. Uh, but they've been there for a long time before that happens. Um, localities, now, so this goes for general too. If you bring your tent because you want to stay out night in the park to cover an event, you may end up having to argue with police. That's kind of the point, one of the points of this. Um, localities typically have rules requiring protesters to obtain a permit for a protest or for specific kinds of protesting, for instance, marching in the street or using um, a PA system. Uh, so in other words, you can you can get a permit and that allows you to use the, uh, PA equipment as a higher decibel than you, than you could if you didn't have a permit. So um, the idea there is that once you have a permit, you won't be uh, cited for violating a noise ordinance. Um, as long as the standards for granting a permit and the scope of the permit satisfy the time, place, and manner restrictions, such processes are usually permitted by the courts and considered constitutional. Where those permit-related restrictions are not followed by a member of the public or a journalist, public officials may try to lawfully deny access. 
And as I said, the tradition is different in different cities. Um, dispersal orders and curfews is a very important point that all of us as journalists have had to deal with, especially in cities like Seattle and Portland, where police are often accused of not giving dispersal orders and then opening up on the crowd and journalists with uh, so-called non-lethal crowd control weapons. Um, even where protesters have a valid permit or no permit is required under local rules, such as like in Seattle, police may order protesters and reporters to disperse from an area if the time, place, and manner restriction test is met. This may occur where protesters are on a sidewalk blocking access to a building or on a street blocking traffic. Similarly, if a reporter is in what is considered an unsafe area, for instance, stopped on a highway to record an accident or standing on a phone booth to record a protest, police could order the protester or the journalist to leave that area, to leave that highway or come down from the top of the phone booth. Police are generally required to issue warnings, ordering protesters and reporters to disperse before making arrests, and courts may consider whether protesters and reporters could in fact hear the warnings in determining whether those arrests were proper. During one famous incident in Seattle, during what I call the Pink Umbrella Riot at 11th and Pine, outside of the Seattle East Precinct Station, uh, back in July, um, police attacked the crowd with crowd control munitions and then issued a dispersal order as they were already attacking people, which is completely illegal. Um, during the recent nationwide protest in response to the death of George Floyd and other people of color, a number of municipalities have issued curfew orders. Many of these curfew orders have exemptions for journalists, either explicitly or by permitting essential workers. Uh, journalists should get as much information as possible about any applicable curfew order before reporting in an area and should wear large, visible media credentials so they're clearly identifiable as members of the press. However, I have to say that uh, I was told by police that I was not allowed to enter Cal Anderson Park regardless uh, during the mayor's emergency orders here in Seattle, regardless of whether I was a journalist or not, which I consider a violation of my right to freedom of the press. But the right to record. Most courts have determined that the First Amendment protects the right to make video recordings of a police officer when they are in public, although this right can be subject to time, place, and manner restrictions as described above, and recording or covering the demonstrations or law enforcement activities should be conducted in a manner that is not obstructing or threatening the safety of others or physically interfering with law enforcement. Many states have eavesdropping or wiretapping statutes that pro prohibit recording private conversations without the consent of one or both parties to the conversation, and some states have statutes that also apply to public conversations. In certain circumstances, courts have held that the application of these statutes infringes on the reporter's First Amendment rights. Nonetheless, reporters should review applicable law and guidance in the states in which they are working. Retaliation. Government officials cannot retaliate against reporters for the reporting or selectively grant access, for example, by denying a press credential. Reporters who have been unfairly denied press credentials should review the applicable law in the jurisdiction to learn how to challenge or appeal the decision. Journalist privilege. Most courts have recognized that journalists have a qualified privilege under the First Amendment against compelled disclosure of materials gathered in the course of their work. Journalists can be required to hand over their work materials, but only in limited circumstances. For instance, if the government demonstrates a compelling need and shows that the information is not obtainable from any other source. This just recently happened in Seattle where the Seattle Police Department issued subpoenas to local journalists and media ordering them to turn over uh, video and audio tape. A judge, it was challenged in court, a judge ruled that uh, people's tri uh, cell phone recordings uh, were not subject to subpoena, that any private material that the journalists possessed was not applicable, and that uh, the only material that could, could be subpoenaed was, uh, as, as this protocol by CPJ mentions, material that was not available by, to any other source. The Seattle Police Department argued that it's a legal case that they were trying to prosecute people uh, who had committed property damage and violence and so they wanted access to the videotapes because they had 
uh, not been able to gain evidence through any other source. I believe that that case is they're still fighting the case, but the latest um, uh, court decision was in favor of the police department, although it restricted, once again, gave you know, a restriction on time and in place of what the police could subpoena, but it did not um, block the police pow police power to subpoena material from reporters. My personal opinion on that is that it should be challenged in court every time because I don't think that that should be legal. Um, how are you to uh, how are you to retain your reputation for trustworthiness and confidentiality if people know that anything you record that they consider confidential could be ordered to be turned over to law enforcement authorities? Why would you talk to a reporter if you knew that? It's one of the same issues that Lowell Bergman, the producer for 60 Minutes, came, came across when 60 Minutes decided to, the CBS News program decided to uh, censor or ask actually uh, an interview with the tobacco industry former executive who was a whistleblower. Lowell Bergman, who's now one of the producers for Frontline, the documentary group at PBS said that was a violation of everything that uh, journalism ethics stood for for it for his agency to censor that information. It's also true when the government tries to subpoena reporters as they did in the the court martial trial of Lieutenant Aaron Rotata at Fort Lewis, Washington, when he refused to lead his troops into battle in Iraq, saying that it was an evil war. Uh, he was court martialed and generals like myself who had interviewed him were being threatened with subpoena to turn over those interviews and recordings to the military court, which we all denied, we refused, we were all willing to go to jail, um, and so the Pentagon just kind of gave up on that and dropped the subpoenas at one point. And we were also supported by all of our news organizations, so Pacifica, KBCS, they stood, stood behind me all, the whole way and said, no, do not turn, turn over that information. They wanted to try to get information for his court martial trial to subpoenaing uh, interviews with journalists. They were trying to find statements that he had made to the press which were considered unbecoming of an officer, which mainly uh, focused on criticisms of the commander-in-chief, which at the time was Lord Shepard Bush, for basically lying the United States into a war. Um, so these are issues that have precedent. Um, and one of the major issues in the United States and something that reporters about order sites and other international news organizations is that the United States does not have adequate shield laws for journalists. There's also been an increase in the prosecution of uh, whistleblowers. Um, many states have what are so-called, quote, shield laws, unquote, um, which generally provide journalists with protection against disclosing the materials, but these are state laws. These protections are not absolute. For example, in one very recent case, a court upheld a subpoena requiring a number of news organizations to turn over unpublished photos and videos of a protest. So they're citing Seattle in this case. If you hit the hyperlink here, it goes to the story about Seattle. The photos and videos were critical for an investigation into the alleged arson of police vehicles and theft of police guns. If a journalist's audio or video recordings or notes are requested or compelled by a government official, including a police officer, the journalist may refuse which we just discussed. And then it's a legal battle. Uh, Fourth Amendment protections of journalists. Um, so we're getting towards uh, the end of their recommendations here, but these are important. The Fourth Amendment protections of journalists search. The Fourth Amendment protects journalists from unreasonable search and seizure. As a general matter, this means that police cannot search one's body or belongings without a warrant. But there are exceptions, including to prevent or avoid serious injury, to prevent the imminent destruction of evidence and with the consent of the person to be searched. So if you give police permission to search, now they have the legal right to do it. So even uh, if they, if it's not legally required that they search, if they get your permission, then you've already given up your legal right. In addition, police may briefly detain and search a person, a quote, stop and frisk, end quote, which has also been challenged in court, especially in the state of New York under Giuliani. And he was there, but for investigative purposes based on a reasonable suspicion that an individual is armed or about to commit a crime. 
but there must be at least some objective justification for the stop and frisk. The officer cannot do it arbitrarily, yes. cannot profile people. The officer um, need not believe that it's more likely than not that a crime is about to be underway. Therefore, this type of stop is generally limited to a pat down, a bag search, or vehicle search to search for weapons. Law enforcement officers generally are not permitted to search the digital content of a general cell phone or camera based on reasonable suspicion alone. Once again, uh, this requires a whole other <laughs> series of discussions about the legality of some of this. Um, but the laws also are different in different states and have been changing. Um, there are reform movements now in some cases that are trying to um, limit the police ability to do these kinds of things. Uh, I can report that when Gil Kurlikowski was the police chief in Seattle before he became the Obama administration drug czar, uh, he uh, distributed memos to the police officers, which were made public, which said, uh, in essence, Seattle police officers will not arrest people for taking their photographs. They will not arrest people for uh, using profanity against them. They will not uh, arrest people for trying to document them arresting someone else. And part of the reason for that was that there were multiple lawsuits being filed against the Seattle Police Department, and it was a fi became a financial liability and burden, which is also happening today, by the way. There are so many lawsuits uh, filed against the Seattle Police Department that their activity at protests has become a major legal, or not just legal, but financial liability, liability for the city. Um, but during that time, there was a period where, was, where Seattle police were actually arresting people for taking their photograph and just things that are completely unconstitutional. Um, so according to the Fourth Amendment, everyone in this country is protected against unreasonable seizure. Um, and that's the next step is search and seizure, right? So in addition to protection against unreasonable search, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable seizure. seizure. A seizure of property occurs when there's some meaningful interference with an individual's possession of that property. A seizure can also be of a person, such as when an individual is stopped and then first as discussed above. And I do need to mention this. Um, I've also been detained by police at protests and um, as a journalist, and they're only allowed to detain you for, for a short period of time because you can argue later in court that this is a false arrest if they, you know, uh, restrict your movement and tell you, you know, you have to stand here or you cannot move and they hold you for a long period of time. Sorry, what did you say? That is not a stop and trust. That is an arrest. And that happened to me with the Washington State Patrol at the state capitol in Olympia during some Occupy Wall Street protests at the state capitol where I was arrested by the Washington State Patrol who did not take me to a police station, they just took me to a room in the back of the Capitol building and gave me a no trespass order, which they told me a sign, which I refused without legal um, representation. It turned out to be an illegal attempt to ban myself and other people from state property during these protests. I challenged it in court as a lead plaintiff and we won. So the Washington State Patrol can no longer detain you and then say that they didn't arrest you, but still give you a no trespass order which says that if you're, if you're seen, if you're observed on state property uh, or on that particular property, uh, any time of the next 60, 90 days, year, whatever period they want to give that, they can no longer do that, which, which was policy at one time. So that's a case where um, a, they, it was a seizure of a person. They seized me, knowing that I was a journalist. I announced that I was a journalist. I was fully um, credentialed and had press passes clearly visible. visible. Um, but they still literally picked me physically up and carried me out of the building because I had refused to leave. Once again, they were going to arrest a whole bunch of people who had been holding a sitting outside the governor's office and told me and other media that we had to leave the building or we would be arrested if I refused. Um, Prior to an arrest and during a temporary seizure of a person, like during a, a quote, stop and frisk, police may also temporarily seize property such as journalistic equipment. Therefore, it is of particular importance for a journalist to prominently display press, press credentials and to identify himself or herself as press when confronted by police so as to hopefully 
as to age any concerns police may have regarding suspected criminal activity and to tip the reasonable suspicion analysis required to a warrantless search and seizure in the journalist's favor. So what the judge is going to do is they're going to look at it and say, so you probably didn't have reasonable suspicion because this person was there working as a journalist. They were not there to rob a bank or you know, portal someone or do something illegal. Um, to preserve the added protections that this law affords to such journalistic materials, a journalist, in addition to prominently displaying his or her press credentials, should let the officers know as soon as possible that certain materials that are uh, that certain that certain materials that are or may be searched, whether they might be notes, memory cards, etc., are press materials related to media intended to be disseminated to the public. The Privacy Protection Act of 1988. Uh, provides for heightened standards to protect against unreasonable media searches and seizures of certain materials um, believed to be related to media or dissemination to the public of information, including work product materials, which would be notes, voicemails containing mental impressions, conclusions, opinions, etc., the person who prepared the materials, and any documentary materials, including videotapes, audio tapes, photographs, and anything else physically documenting an event. These materials generally cannot be searched or seized unless they are reasonably believed to relate to a crime committed by the person possessing the materials. They may, however, be held for a custodial storage incident to an arrest of the journalist possessing the materials. So long as the material is not searched, it is returned to the arrestee intact. Okay, I'm going to leave right now. Now, this brings up all sorts of issues too because. Um, there have been journalists who, there's been an attempt to prosecute journalists, especially at an incident near Standing Rock, um, for conspiracy, because they were there when some vandalism, uh, private property took place, it was a, I believe it was an oil drilling rig, and the reporter did not report that, and so the police accused them of being part of the conspiracy by having knowledge of an illegal act and not reporting it. Uh, do not believe that the prosecutions are successful in that case. A similar thing was tried against Amy Goodman, a reporter, uh, and producer of Democracy Watch News. And in most cases, those um, law enforcement uses those cases, and the reporter does not have to uh, serve any jail time. However, there are journalists in jail right now and have been across the country refusing to reveal their sources in court cases, and that's part of the lack of the shield laws. There needs to be a federal shield law for protecting journalists and that kind of thing, but um, often it doesn't get reported that there are journalists who have served jail time because they refuse to give up their sources because they, they don't have adequate shield laws in their state. Um, so arrest, when an arrest is, uh, is made, it's essentially a seizure of a person. And so also um, brings to bear the Fourth Amendment. An officer must have probable cause to make an arrest. Probable cause requires more than a mere suspicion, but less than absolute certainty that, that a crime has been or is being committed. The standard is intended to be practical and non-technical as a result. It's a fluid concept, turning on the assessment of probabilities in particular factual context. This is legalese, I'm sorry, but so it's written. Not readily or even usefully reduced to a neat set of legal rules. It is well established that mere proximity to criminal activity does not establish probable cause for an arrest. So a law by journalists should not be arrested for covering a protest or demonstration event if that demonstration becomes unruly or violent, which, which I you know, witnessed before you know, in, at an event where literally buildings are burning and I'm filming it and the police realize I'm a protester, so we have no probable cause. Uh, however, the standard of what is probable cause because it is a fluid concept, can be abused by law enforcement officers and often has been. If it's left up to the the, um, the decision on the side of the police officer, they, they can um, overstep their bounds, which sometimes leads to legal cases up or some kind of um, uh, punishment of that uh, officer, but the only recourse really there is that the officer has a long-standing uh, reputation for overstepping those, those bounds, and then it, it can, there can be a, uh, 
some accountability demanded for. But at the time, it happens. The, law, the officer has the right to decide if you have that leeway. Um, when an officer makes an, a lawful arrest, the arrest in, uh, impacts what qualifies as a reasonable search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment. So it's considered uh, reasonable for an officer to search an individual for weapons and evidence when making an arrest, even if the officer has no actual objective concern for safety or evidence preservation. This means that an officer with probable cause to arrest a journalist for an example, disobeying a lawful order of dispersal, violating a curfew, trespassing, or participating in another unlawful act, the cop may have legal uh, justification to search through the belongings of that journalist. However, a search or seizure incident um, to, to arrest is limited to the area within the immediate control or vicinity of the arrestee. In other words, anything which could be easily reached as a potential weapon, such as in the dead large piece of camera equipment, a tripod, or easily destroyed evidence, such as camera film or memory cards. And the point there is that the, if the police think that the, the uh, journalist has in, themselves has actually been involved in illegal activity, um, they, have, they have some legal justification to actually search yourself. Or if they suspect you have a weapon. Often during protests, officers choose to issue citations as opposed to making arrests. The law is unsettled as to whether officers make that searches incident to the issuance of these citations. Some courts, including the federal courts in New York, have held that a law enforcement officer need not intend to make an arrest in order to conduct a search incident to arrest, so long as the officer has probable cause to make an arrest and conducts the search prior to giving a citation. Federal courts in western states, including California, Oregon, and Washington, have taken a different approach. Their search incident, search incident to arrest is only permissible when an arrest is actually made. Therefore, if an officer seeks to conduct a search of a journalist, the journalist may want to ask whether they are being arrested, as this may affect what rights the journalist has to refuse the search. On the other hand, it may also escalate the encounter and cause the officer to place the journalist under arrest when perhaps it wasn't the officer's intention in the beginning. But importantly, a search incident to arrest likely does not extend to a search of the contents of mobile phones or cameras. The Supreme Court has held that a search of digital data on a cell phone does not implicate the risk of harm to an officer or evidence preservation, and is therefore outside of the scope of a lawful search incident to arrest. This holding would likely apply to digital cameras as well, as cameras contain data similar to that stored on cell phone devices. Seizure of these items is likely permissible, though, they can seize them, they're not allowed to search. I know it's a confusing legal point, and we probably really should just have someone kind of to protect journalists on this podcast again to help explain that. But this guide was prepared uh, for the Committee to Protect Journalists by a group called TRUSPA, and also by the Thomas Reuters Foundation's Global Pro Bono Legal Program. So, um, excuse me, the Thompson Reuters Foundation. is It's a foundation of Thomson Reuters, the global news and information services company. And this is what they say. We work to advance media freedom, raise awareness of human rights issues, and foster more inclusive economies. Through news, media development, free legal assistance, and convening initiatives, the foundation combines its unique services to drive systematic change. Trust Law is the Thomson Reuters Foundation's global pro bono legal program connecting the best law firms and corporate legal teams around the world with high-impact NGOs and social enterprises working to create social and, and environmental change. We produce groundbreaking legal research and offer innovative training courses worldwide. So that's offered by the Thomson Reuters Foundation, which was commissioned by the Committee to Protect Journalists to put this guy together. This is Mark Gilo Canto. Reporting from Seattle for Democracy Watch News' Democracy Cast podcast. I hope this was helpful to journalists and the public in general. listening to Democracy Cast from Democracy Watch News. Democracy Cast is available wherever you access your podcasts. You can also hear it at TuneIn Radio. You can follow Democracy Watch News at Facebook 
and subscribe to our international news feeds at Twitter. Check out the website, where you'll find links to our podcasts and blogs, democracywatchnews.org. Special thanks to Steve Barnes, Sally Gellert, and John Harvey for technical assistance. The Democracy Cast theme was composed by Mark Taylor Canfield. Thanks for listening.